So good evening. Uh, I'm Graham Allison, and we're looking forward to a spectacular evening, and I'm so pleased to have two new senior fellows, non-resident, at the Belfer Center as our guests tonight. So Jim Clapper uh, was, until January 20th, the Director of National Intelligence for the U.S. government. Uh, on January 20th, he retired after 53 years of service. Uh, <laughs> Most of it in the intelligence community, and uh, uh, the benefit that we have here is an opportunity to, at the center to have uh, the wisdom of somebody accumulated over all these years is fantastic. Mike Rogers, uh, another new senior fellow Don resident, uh, was uh, in his previous incarnation the Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. But before that, he was an FBI a special agent. And before that, he was in the Army. So for somebody who's seen the intelligence community uh, uh, from a lot of different angles, I would say we're, again, extremely fortunate to have somebody with that perspective. So thank you, Mike. <laughs> so we were, we were chatting just to get started here. The game plan for tonight is, we're going to have a conversation among ourselves for a few minutes, and then at some point we're going to go to the audience for questions and discussion. And, uh, but I thought, uh, and actually Mike suggested it would be useful, take a minute each to just explain what is your perspective given your career and the seat from which you looked at the intelligence enterprise. Because for those of you not familiar, so if you read in the newspaper, it's got something called the intelligence community. And again, what means that? Well, then there's CIA. Well, okay, we've heard of that. Well, then there's 18 other agencies. Well, we've heard about most of them. And then there's this thing called the Directorate of National Intelligence. And then, but in any case, this just happens to be the executive branch component of this. If you think about the intelligence enterprise, there's also, uh, something called the president, and there's something called the executive branch, and then there's something called the Congress. And so these are somewhat different perspectives the way things were designed. So Jim, tell us just a little bit about your perspective and then Mike. Well, <clears throat> the uh, origins of uh, the position of the Director, Na Na Director of National Intelligence uh, can be traced to uh, the 9-11 Commission. And uh, one of the recommendations they made that there should be someone uh, in a position to uh, lead the community and to uh, foster uh, integration. And obviously the prior construct had been that the director of Central Intelligence Agency would be dual-handed as the um, DCI, Director of Central Intelligence. And uh, I think I see Michael Morell here, but my observation was that in 20 or 25 years worth of uh, up close and personal observation of directors of Central Intelligence Agency slash DCIs that sooner or later, mostly sooner, they tended to get consumed with agency-centric issues and would you know, pay attention to the community when, the, when they needed to. So the, the conclusion was that there needed to be full-time a person to do that. That found its way into what's called the uh, IRTPA, the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act, which uh, President Bush signed into law on the 17th of December uh, 2004, a seriously uh, flawed piece of legislation, but you know that's that's what that's the way it is. There are three basic tasks of the uh, DNI, which is to uh, manage the national intelligence. Well, first to be the primary, but not necessarily exclusive, but primary advisor to the president for uh, intelligence, counterintelligence, and security matters. Uh, to run what's called the NIP, the National Intelligence Program, which is the programmatic aggregation that funds uh, the national uh, pieces of, the, of what's defined as the community, and to, in your spare time, lead the, uh, lead the enterprise. And so I was the uh, fourth incumbent uh, of uh, the position. Uh, the first three went about five years, one month. I did six and a half years. Um, in reference to your comment, um, I, an FAQ towards the end, frequently asked questions, well, uh, Director, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment? And my response was, I lasted. 
And so that's uh, kind of the thumbnail of the, of, of, so of the position. Mike, what, what is a member of Congress's perspective on uh, all this? Well, it does depend on the member of Congress. I think we've learned that. Um, <laughs> at least you would laugh at that, I figured. So the committee is an important, really an important function in the national security space, I think. So when I became chairman, over the years we had seen that partisanship had crept in even to the intelligence community, and it was almost non-functional. Uh, they hadn't even produced a budget that they could agree on six years prior to me assuming the chairmanship. So I had a very good working relationship with my cohort, uh, who was a personal friend of mine, a guy named Dutch Rupersberger. We sat down when he became the ranking member and I became the chairman and said, listen, this is important space. He was a prosecutor in his former life. I was a former FBI agent. I figured we ought to be able to work this out. Uh, we decided that we would establish an operating procedure that would try to defang the partisanship in the national security space. We felt we needed a classified space to have honest, thoughtful discussions, disagreements, agreements, and then finally conclusion and collaboration on getting the tools that our intelligence services needed, as well as maybe uh, any problems that we might have, and have a forum of which we could address those problems in a classified setting, uh, and then move out smartly on any agreed upon uh, future. So our job was the 16 agencies plus the, the DNI's office, so 17 intelligence agencies of the United States, uh, our job was all of the budgeting. The I think public uh, number for that at the time was about $75 billion. It's actually gone down a little bit to about $72 billion. Uh, it, we did all of the policy review, uh, covert action review on a smaller set of the committee. Uh, all the, all the uh, counterintelligence actions, current and ongoing, as you can imagine, very sensitive information. So we tried to reestablish the committee in its original intent and form to do that legitimate oversight uh, and again, try to foster a better relationship between Congress uh, and the executive branch when it came to following the law, following policy, and our influence through the budget that we had at the committee. So that was really the way we looked at our role. Uh, and we passed a budget every single year, and actually the first year we passed the previous year's budget too, just to prove a point. And as, as we'll see in the, in the conversation, uh, as we've already been, uh, Mike and Jim and I've been talking, there's some differences in perspective of the Director of National Intelligence and the Chairman of the, uh, of the House Intelligence Committee, and we'll try to illuminate those. I should have said, to start with, and apologize, and we want to welcome especially the members of the International Council of the Belfer Center who are here, um, and many of whom are here, and two of them are the former Director of CIA, uh, David Petraeus, and the former Deputy Director, Michael Morell. So after the commentary and whatever. If you have a strong point of agreement or disagreement, we'll let you do the microphones first. Uh, so in any case, uh, I pick up my uh, local newspaper here on Sunday. Uh, so the topic today is Russiagate, everything you were wanted to know but were afraid to ask. So here's the Sunday Globe that says, keep your eyes on Russia. Okay. And it's in a full page editorial uh, they never do full page editorials, says we're forgetting to keep our eye on the ball. So I thought it was like an advertisement for our forum here tonight. It says, you know, we got to figure out what do we know and what do we not know and why does it matter? So it starts off actually, it says a fog has descended on Washington. Well, excuse me, what's new about that? Uh, <laughs> And there's a fog here, because if somebody's trying to make sense just as an ordinary citizen who has life, so they're not reading every little leak, every little claim, every little assertion, to figure out what do we know, at least at this stage, about Russiagate, okay? And then secondly, I want to go from there, but let's first, what do we know, and what do we not know? And then secondly, so what, okay? Uh, what's its significance? So let me, uh, for what do we know, since you're called up repeatedly, Jim, by Congress uh, to testify to say, okay, so what do we know? And you keep telling them, well, there's some things we know and there's a lot of things we don't know. Let's play the first clip very quickly and then the questions to you. This well, was your last, I think we have a clip with of respect your testifying, to, if it works. Uh, we don't. The findings is that 
We will first address Russia's goals and intentions. We have high confidence that President Putin ordered an influence campaign in 2016 aimed at the U.S. presidential election. The goals of this campaign were to undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process, denigrate Secretary Clinton, and harm her electability and potential presidency. Okay. So at this stage, what do we know? Well, we know, uh, you know, what we said in the, uh, in, our, in the intelligence community assessment that was published on the 6th of January, <clears throat> and that was a real uh, quick uh, summation of it, that uh, um, clearly uh, the Russians, and this was, the shots were called here at the, at the highest level, uh, were interested first in sowing uh, dissension and doubt and discord uh, in this country. And as the, the uh, campaign wore on, their, their objectives kind of switched. Uh, they too didn't take initially uh, Mr. Trump seriously. Um, but later on, uh, they did. And the primary motivation was intense animus towards the Clintons, both uh, former President Clinton as well as uh, uh, former, former Secretary Clinton. And then more and more, uh, Mr. Trump grew to be an appealing uh, candidate. And so they, they, they threw their weight uh, behind that and to the point where they clearly favored uh, Mr. Trump over uh, Hillary Clinton. So we published uh, two versions uh, of this, a classified version and a unclassified version. The key judgments rendered were identical. Uh, we tried to put as much substantiation as we could at the unclassified level, and that was by design because uh, President Obama had order, uh, directed this in the first week of December of 2016, and we put together all that we could, um, compile all the reporting that we had, all the intelligence we had on what the Russians were doing, and put that in one, uh, one report, no matter how highly classified it was, so we would have that to hand off to the next administration and to the Congress. As well, he, he directed that uh, to the extent that we possibly could to make that as much of that unclassified as possible to release the Amer to the American public, which I felt personally was extremely important. <clears throat> this was part of a multifaceted campaign in addition to, of course, the uh, famous uh, hacking that went on. They did a lot of other things. Uh, the classical propaganda, uh, paying people to p insert uh, social media, uh, fake news that they generated, uh, RT very, very active uh, in uh, propaganda, which was very pro-Trump and very anti-Clinton. Uh, um, the, I know it's, it's been, uh, we were criticized, of course, uh, and understandably so, because we could not be as forthcoming with uh, the evidence, the, the evidentiary base for these assertions uh, in, in, the, in the unclassified public release version. But uh, we, and I say we, the uh, participating elements here, which was CIA, NSA, FBI, and under the aegis of ODNI, um, almost, almost uniformly had very high confidence in the judgments that came out in this thing. And in my view, the, the uh, evidence for it was overwhelming. It was extremely compelling. Uh, just on the face of the, just on the basis of, of the SIGINT and the cyber evidence alone, uh, to me is irrefutable. Now, unfortunately, for reasons that this group will understand from the sources, methods, and tradecraft standpoint, we couldn't, we couldn't expose that. Uh, so we did the best we could, and we only had a month or so uh, to do this, a pretty strict uh, deadline that President Obama wanted it done before the end of his term. So, so basically, we can read the January 6th report, the public version, and the key findings are stated clearly, and the classified report only gives you more reason for believing what's in the 6th January. There's more substantiation, yes. obviously, right. in, the, in the classified okay. version. So, Mike, what, what do you think? What do we know now uh, at this stage? Yeah. Add or subtract, yeah. And, and just one quick thing before Please. we do that. Uh, I, 
I did not believe that the director of national intelligence was going to work after the first few directors, not because they weren't good and qualified people who were making a valiant effort. What fundamentally changed the way the director of national intelligence functioned uh, was a guy named Jim Clapper. Now, I, I say that now because we're going to disagree and fight a lot here in a few minutes. But I'm kidding. <laughs> Maybe. I'm just kidding. <laughs> He came in and brought a level of professionalism to the DNI, and he brought such gravitas to the job, it finally ironed out the wrinkles that we thought would never go away. Uh, and he candidly made me believe in the function of the Director of Nas the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And from that, we saw an improvement of the, the uh, daily briefs to the President. I thought the product got exponentially better because there was more inclusion in what went in the product that went on the President's desk. We started dealing with these really hard strategic problems of the intelligence community we could never quite get around because there was always a fire to put out somewhere and your focus was there. Jim Clapper came in and, and changed the function of that. Didn't get into uh, operations unless he absolutely had to and helped us deal with long-term budgeting, what does our satellite uh, architecture look like in 10 years? All the questions we were having a hard time getting answered. So I thought I'd throw that on the table. It was a valiant 53 years, and I think the last, he says he, he had his, his greatest accomplishment was staying six years. I'm gonna adamantly disagree. He actually made the DNI function like we would all be proud that it functioned. So for that, I wanna thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I, I even see David Petraeus shaking his head agreeing, so that, where it appears to be, yes. Okay, good. So Secondly, go ahead. I'll tell you this story about the Russians. Now, I, on the other hand. Yes. On the other hand, yeah, yeah. that dirty, rotten dog of the DNI. We, we, when I was a young FBI agent, I, I mean, they call it getting the ticket. I got a ticket on a professor at a national laboratory who was approached by a Russian, uh, this was been the mid-80s, uh, when I was gonna save the world and put every bad guy in jail. Uh, and so I get this ticket, I'm very excited about it. And long story short, uh, this professor was going on to these different conferences and a, and a certain individual uh, who was Russian would kept showing up and making approaches to him. It was, you know, he was very clumsy at it, but apparently it, it worked because he did it enough. And so I, we got onto this guy, and I'm doing this interview, and so I'm going through and I'm saying, sir, I, uh, the, the Russian who happened to be still in the United States, and I said, sir, I, I'm having a hard time, remember the 80s, we didn't have Google back then. I know it's shocking to many of you. Uh, I couldn't confirm his academic credentials back at that time in the Soviet Union. I, could, I was having a hard time getting even verified that he was at the stature that he claimed to be at these technical centers. And he was having a very difficult time answering basic uh, questions that somebody at that technical level would be able to answer. He was, he was having a hard time getting there. He kept blaming it on his English. Hmm. So we'd go through and he said, well, uh, and I won't do my Russian accents really bad. But he would always say, he said, oh, well, we have a different word for that. We have a different word for that in Russian, and it'll come to me, and I'll, I'll, I'll be able to translate it in a minute. And I went, okay. Well, then I went in through, and I said, your travel records are very suspicious to us. Uh, we go, every place that there's this interesting technological uh, gathering or conference, you're there even if it's not related to your academic credentials that you tell me that you have that I cannot prove that you have. And he said, oh, we have a different word for that, and it'll come to me in a minute. So we go through the interview, and I'm kind of scratching my head trying to figure out how I get around it. And he goes, ah, I know what it is. Flexibility. Wow, okay. What they were doing back then is really a lot what you're seeing today. It didn't change. So the biggest shock to me in this whole thing is this whole public denial that the Russians were trying to influence an election at all. Why we should be surprised is shocking to me. If you look at the total history of Russian intelligence service activities, including going back to Latin America, there's a great book by a former KGB officer say the world, uh, called The World Was Going Our Way, where they talk about influencing elections in Latin America and how they believe, the Russians believed, the center believed, that they were winning that fight, that they were actually moving the needle in their direction. And they would do it the old-fashioned way. They would find uh, uh, newspaper people and bribe them. Uh, to write certain stories. They would infiltrate political parties and try to sow discourse. They wanted discourse. They wanted lack of confidence in the election. All of these things that they wanted to accomplish. But they did it through, the again, the old-fashioned way. They had somebody showing up at a conference. 
They had somebody showing up, knocking on a reporter's door, trying to find some weakness so that they could recruit that reporter, including, by the way, just paying that reporter back then. And so they found a way, it was, but you can imagine doing it that way is, is not nearly as effective as the internet, social media. And so all they're doing is applying their same skill sets that they had developed over the 70 years that they've been doing this kind of thing, and then took this huge and new powerful tool Right, the so, uh, social media, uh, and were incredibly impactful. And as, you, as the director was saying, I think the evidence is just overwhelming how they were trying to influence. What I don't agree with, uh, and both political parties are gonna say, they're gonna fight about what, whose side were they on. I almost think you should take, take that away, right? You know, one party wants you to believe that Putin had you around the throat as they walked into the voting booths and you know, push that button right there. That, that part wasn't happening. They saw the same polls that we did. Some notion that the Russians knew that Trump was a, had the, uh, an opportunity to win this thing more than US public polling, I find ridiculous, right? They were, they were more concerned, in my mind, to try to sow chaos discontent. Uh, and they are very good at it. And that's what you're seeing happening in France, you're gonna see it happen in Germany, you're gonna, ha you're gonna see this all over Europe because they have found something that works. And remember, they don't have the same kind of resources even U.S. intelligence services do. So when they find something that works, you're going to see it a lot because they don't have a whole lot of play, uh, uh, plays in that playbook. But what they have is powerful and it's effective. And we have yet, I argue, in a public policy arena, figured out how we're going to deal with it. Well, Mike's absolutely right. The Russians have a long, uh, before them, the Soviets, a long history of influence the elections, theirs and other people's. And there's a there's history in, in this country, going back to the 60s, where, uh, rather crudely maybe, but they, they attempted to influence uh, the outcome of elections by, through funding and propaganda and this sort of thing. The difference, though, uh, in the election of 2016 is that this is the most assertive, most aggressive, and most directly impactful that, uh, of any uh, engagement that they've had in, in, in our elections. And Mike's also absolutely right about this is going to continue. Uh, you know, they, they have to have regard what they did as a huge success. They're, they've been doing it in France and they'll do it in Germany. And there's all kinds of motivations for that, but when you think about resource expended versus uh, result, uh, they got to be pretty happy with uh, what they've done. And that will reinforce, I think, ratcheting this up even more uh, in the future. And I let just me, let me be the devil's advocate for a minute here to ask. So, are, are they the only country that attempts to influence uh, elections? Uh, are they the only country that tries to influence who becomes a government, or even the only country to influence a government, maybe even to undermine a, a, a government? I mean, I've, as a student of history. I think I can remember there were some guys called Nicar in Nicaragua, the Sandinistas, and I do think we helped overthrow them. Uh, and I was in favor of it. Uh, yeah, but that was all so, for a good cause. <laughs> yeah, well, like, no, I mean, I have no question that we're the good guys and they're the bad guys, so uh, there's no moral equivalence here. But is to be, is, if, if a Martian were looking at this and said, who interferes most frequently in other countries' elections? Uh, excuse me, we announced that we promote democracy. So and I'm in favor of promoting democracy. That's the right form of government. Our constitution, actually, our Declaration of Independence says all human beings, whichever country, should be able to uh, you know, be free. And, uh, so uh, from a Russian point of view, are we just doing to them sort of like what we do to guys in Ukraine. If there's a government, there's a demonstration, a guy that we said was democratically elected, Yanukovych is there, lo and behold, uh, he's overthrown by a crowd who, where we had an assistant secretary out giving out cookies and cheering him on. Yeah. Well, uh, Putin himself uh, uh, ascribed, uh, particularly Secretary Clinton, um, uh, an attempt to uh, promote a color revolution. I mean, that's the way he perceived it uh, in, in Russia and uh, to overturn him. 
Uh, he held us accountable for the Panama Papers and the uh, doping scandal. And so the, the, this is just a part of doing business. And, and sure, uh, you know, we've, we have favored uh, candidates in, in other in, in parties and groupings in, in other countries. And, and there, yes, that's a long, there's a long history of this. I, I just have to say, I just think in this, in this particular case, the behavior of the Russians was just uh, kind of over the top and, and particularly egregious. So uh, this one's special. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, that was our again, and their, their purpose was to sow discontent and mistrust in our elections. They wanted us at each other's throat by the time it was over, which I think 10 years from now when somebody looks back, they're going to think, boy, they did a pretty yeah, darn good job. How did they do? Yes. They did a great job. We're still fighting over it. We are still passionately, emotionally debating whatever your political philosophy is on what happened in the election. We have not resolved it ourselves. And it's influencing, by the way, legislative process to today, I would argue. That's wildly successful. And you probably put a dollar figure on what they spent on this versus other covert action programs maybe around the world. This thing is a bargain, uh, an absolute bargain. And I would argue that the US role does take a moral uh, imperative in any decision that they would have to support US interests where we find them around the world. And it isn't done in the way of purposely misleading, trying to sow discontent, exacerbating violence within a country in and of itself. Uh, for that, for that particular purpose of discontent. Now, there's difference between su supporting elements who are seeking freedom and other things. I would argue that's a different case. It has a different moral imperative. Uh, yes, the United States does do that. But by the way, it goes through a pretty extensive process, including uh, the oversight by its elected representatives in the separate but equal branch, uh, so, the United States Congress. So let me get to the question of, so uh, what we don't know. So the, again, the Globe tells us what we need to know is did, quote, did President Trump himself know about, approve, or invite the Russian role in undermining our election? So what do we know about this? And what can we do to know more? Jim? Well, as I stated, I don't know of, of any evidence uh, of that and did, and did not. And that, none of that found its way into the, uh, uh, in the intelligence community assessment, e even in the, the classified version. Now, that's not to say that my knowledge here was complete. Uh, I had no uh, evidence of, that was presented to me of, of, of collusion. But that, uh, again, that's not to say that it didn't happen. I just, I never saw any evidence of it, as I've stated publicly. But since you were DNI uh, and you were conducting this survey, if there had been any evidence at that point, you would have a pretty good If it view. met the evidentiary bar that we established and agreed on, which was you know, pretty high confidence, uh, I think the, the answer is yes. But no such evidence was, was uh, presented to me during the time that we were uh, doing this. And so Mike, would you agree or disagree? No, I, no, I agree. And I don't think we're going to know until the FBI investigation is done. But one of the only ways that uh, you know, Washington, D.C. gets exercised is jumping to conclusions. Um, and they are, <laughs> I mean, and, and character assassination is a side sport. And I just think that everybody needs to calm down about what conclusion they come to until we know all of the evidence. The FBI is investigating any they would call it collusion. Uh, I doubt that that's the, that is probably not the premise. As an old FBI guy, that's not the premise of their investigation. They're probably looking at other angles of this thing. And when that is done, then we'll know. Uh, but until then, I, I think it's probably dangerous to say he was or he was not. You can have your own beliefs, but I just don't think we know that. Um, and candidly, the way that campaign was run, I'd be highly suspect that they had an organized plan to do anything let alone uh, <laughs> try to figure out a conspiracy to work with Vladimir Putin to disrupt U.S. elections. I, just find, you know, I find that a pretty high bar. I think the FBI will have to establish that. I do think uh, <clears throat> there's an important point here uh, with specific respect to uh, the FBI, which occupy, at least in my mind, occupies a unique position in the national security apparatus in that it straddles both law enforcement and intelligence. And at least during my time as uh, DNI, the six and a half years, uh, I worked with 
Bob Mueller and, and, now, and then Jim Comey, was to be very deferential to that distinction. And I gave, gave great deference to the directors of the FBI to decide whether, when, and how much to tell me or anyone else in the IC about the state of play of an investigation, particularly when it involved, when it was focused on U.S. persons. That's a unique and delicate role that the FBI plays by virtue of its straddling both those worlds. So Mike, we were chatting before. What is it that you disagree most strongly with about uh, Jim's views and vice versa? But let's start with you. Maybe I ought to set <laughs> Why didn't we like each other? Is that the question? That? Yeah, would you do that? Yep. So we just thought, well, let's come up with, instead of having love in all the time, let's come up with something where we have some dis disagreement. And, and I'll, I will say, just preface uh, that by, uh, so you know where I'm, my, my reg high regard for Mike Rogers is, uh, I've, you know, I'm, I've achieved intelligence geezerdom, and I was around when uh, the committees were first stood up, and I was a young pup in the intelligence committees during Church Pike and all that. And I've seen, uh, known most about, just about all the chairmen of the, uh, of the, of the and uh, I have to say that Mike is one of a handful, maybe the best, and a unique beacon of bipartisanship when Mike and Dutch Rupersberg are running the, the committee. And you don't see that very often, all too rare. And boy, did we miss you when you left, friend. <laughs> now, so we're thinking about half of our district. What, what is it we could that, what that is that we could talk about where we sort of had a difference? Jim has to be careful since he's got four more hearings yeah. to do. I'm radioactive. So this so, is uh, this yeah. is on air. So uh, yeah. uh, the chairman, the new chairman, just heard what you said. But in any case, go ahead. So in the in the course of uh, our dialogue back and forth, uh, which was always uh, very professional. Um, we had one, one uh, issue that c came up during the course of the negotiations with uh, Iran. And uh, we were chastised by uh, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, House Federal Select Committee for Intelligence, about our failure to keep the committee fully and currently and accurately informed on that, of course, I had put it was uh, intelligence committee was kind of in a in an awkward position because these were, uh, you know, uh, secret negotiations. We didn't want to have them exposed publicly, and so the, the question that came up in my mind is, what is the extent of the intelligence community's responsibility to spy on the administration on behalf of the committee? Now, Mike probably wouldn't characterize it quite that way. <laughs> Now you see where the trouble started. Yeah. So I'll stop there and uh, over to you, Mike. Uh, okay, so we did have a big disagreement on that. The good news is you, none of you have heard about this because we did it in the way I think the committee is designed to do it. And it was all behind closed doors at the time. And now obviously the, the agreement is out and signed and the, it's, it's past history. But at the time there were some pretty strong disagreements about where it was. And the oddest thing, so I do believe uh, in the importance Again, let me back up. One of the reasons we in, I reinstated this bipartisan effort to do serious oversight was because I knew that they would have to bring us things that we're just not going to agree on. It doesn't mean we're going to run to the microphone. It doesn't mean we're going to have a press conference every day to talk about the things we disagreed on. Uh, that's the role of the committee. I, and my argument is if you want to be able to handle classified material, uh, with two branches of government, you have to have an institution somewhere or a body somewhere uh, that can get that information and have a free conversation about it. I think that's a serious problem if we can't do that. So I saw this was as the first time we had this serious agreement. And what shocked me most was that a foreign intelligence service brought it to my attention. And you can imagine, as somebody who took my role as chairman pretty seriously, I would say, not amused, right? So I had to call down to the White House and say, you're not gonna believe what happened to me today. You know, funny thing happened to me on the way into the Intelligence Committee. Uh, I was notified about negotiations in Oman uh, that related to Iran's nuclear program. And I can tell you, this is where I, this got kind of sticky a little bit. There were other programs that I might be interested in as chairman as an oversight role that may have involved Iran's nuclear program. Right? So we were making decisions on those kinds of things, not realizing that there's somebody was negotiating a, something that was 
fairly transformational to these other programs of which we were discussing and applying money to. So I came away from a very different perspective about spying on the president. Uh, I looked at it as this is the good course of oversight. And, and by the way, at the time, there was bipartisan disagreement on where they were going. It wasn't just Mike Rogers being a partisan thinking this was a bad idea. And so there was lots of conversations you made as it followed it. Uh, and you might want to, I, I did take a different tact. I think the chairman was, or the director was not very amused Actually, with me. So uh, <laughs> the method of taking us to the woodpile was uh, I set up a system of NIMS or National Intelligence Managers four, and each one was in charge either of a region or a functional intelligence uh, uh, issue. And their job for me was to kind of oversee the community and uh, ensure that uh, we're maximizing collection analysis or, or help set up task forces, et cetera. So we had about, uh, I don't know, 17 or 18 of them uh, when I was uh, director. And so what Mike did was summon each one of them separately to his uh, committee and have a little tutorial on keeping the Congress fully and accurately informed. Now, according to the law, I just, just want to yeah. mention that. <laughs> uh, the, the good news is actually, and this was done very quiet and discreetly, it wasn't a big thing on TV or anything like that. And actually it was, a, a, it, it turned out to be, I have to admit, grudgingly admit, a, 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 a positive, constructive exercise. For one, the NIMS felt like the, they had you know, importance and stature enough that you would spend the time doing that. And I, I did have to admire Mike's stamina. You know, after doing about 12 or 15 of them, he's still at it. So, so it was, uh, but it does illustrate, uh, I think, uh, at least for me, the sometimes awkward position that uh, the IC is in and its leadership is in between uh, doing the executive branches, the White House's bidding versus your responsibility, which I certainly acknowledge and which is necessary for keeping uh, the Congress informed. So if I tell uh, the committee about, or the committees about, uh, here's a, actually kind of a standard thing that Intel does to support negotiations. Well, what are the negotiations about? Well, they're about, uh, you know, striking a bargain with the Iranians on their nuclear capability. Well, I oppose that from a policy standpoint. And so, you know, that puts us in, in an awkward position. So I, I, I brought that up or bring it up just to illustrate uh, it's the, the nature of our system. Uh, there is friction uh, between uh, the, uh, and among the branches, uh, which is maybe a, a commentary on the genius of the founding fathers. And I will just say one thing about that, and why I think it showed that the committee can work, actually, even when we disagree. I mean, I passionately disagreed with where they were going and all of that. That's all on the record. But what I thought was good about it is that we had people who disagreed on both sides, by the way, of both sides of the committee. We went through this for months. There was no leaks. Nobody knew about the negotiations. We never disclosed it publicly. None of the, no one on the committee leaked the information. To me, that shows that they understood that it's okay to have a forum. You have to have a forum for this to happen. If you believe your elected representatives should have oversight of your intelligence committee, and I believe it actually helps the intelligence committee to have that, uh, it can work. What doesn't work in my mind is unfortunately what you see today where someone runs to the microphone and says, He's innocent, the next day he's guilty. The next day he's really, oh, I saw something that makes him really guilty. Oh, I saw something that makes him really innocent. That is a complete injustice to a functioning body that has some very, very serious consequences if they get this wrong. Uh, and I do think it will impact the committee's ability to interact with the intelligence committee. You'll go into what was what we used to call 20 questions where you'd have to, you'd haul them in front of the committee, this was years ago, and if you didn't ex ask exactly the right question, you wouldn't get exactly the answer you were looking for. And so you play this 20 question problem. I would like to think the way we ran the committee, we got away from that. We had a dialogue, and the, the committees were more dialogue with the intelligence services in a way that I think most Americans would want to happen. 
You know, well, what happens if this happens? You know, you want to go through the list of consequences of actions or not, or consequences of inaction in a forum where you can have that discussion and so we could all make a decision together. I worry now that we're right back into that same place before, and I saw it, and you all have some horror stories. I've heard your horror stories over a, a gin martini, or, or you don't have those, do you? Uh, they're pretty awful. And so I, I worry about the institution of of Congress, which I think is an important institution, despite the, you know, the, the clowns and the circus-like atmosphere you see sometimes. It's a, an important institution for our democracy, and if that goes away, if you lose that ability to have these kinds of pretty serious high-level disagreements, I worry about how we get good oversight and good policy and good support of our intelligence services doing really, really, really important work around the world. But, okay, so let me say where we are in the conversation. One of the wonders of the forum is that uh, we have in the, in the forum all sorts of people who know a lot about this topic who might as well be talking. As uh, I remember the first forum we ever had here, it was a long time ago, Teddy uh, Kennedy sat up in one of the loges and asked the first question and gives a you know, sense of, well, wait a minute, there's all sorts of people here. So let me ask David and Michael Morell to go to the, there's two microphones here on the floor. And, and say what you want to say, Michael over here, this one right there. And then as soon as they've said whatever they want to say and our guests say what they want to say, line up at these microphones on the floor and on the loge and we'll call on you. But David Petraeus first, who was a, uh, is well, a member of the International Council and the former director of CIA. Thank you. Um, look, I join in saluting these two great public servants, uh, both of them were the best that I ever saw in the times that I was interacting uh, with the committee or with the, uh, the DNI. Um, and let's keep in mind, by the way, that you know, Jim Clapper followed someone who actually lost a power struggle between the DNI and the director of the CIA. Uh, Admiral Denny Blair and Leon Panetta has so much friction. Uh, and you saw this, of course, Mike, it was before you were the committee chairman, I think, but, uh, but nonetheless observed this from the committee. Um, and, and frankly, what Director Clapper did, by the way, he also had, of course, decades in uniform prior to this. I remember when he was DIA, I think when we were doing the surge in Iraq and other things. I mean, there's so many intersections over the years and so many different contributions. We're focusing on the one that I think is the most significant, and it was not just survival. It was really showing how the position of Director of National Intelligence should be uh, filled and how the duties should be performed. What was great about Jim Clapper was that he was just very secure in himself. There was no big ego there. We've seen that, you know, he's, this is not someone who was out to show that he was in charge of the community. Uh, I remember sitting down even before the confirmation hearing and we had an agreement right away that how you would work out certain issues that were sources of big friction, again, between Leon Panetta and Denny Blair. Uh, and keeping in mind that the director of the CIA still reported directly to the president through, generally through the National Security Advisor, and Tom Donnell, I think, is in the audience, uh, for covert action. So you still had that direct, and that's why the director of the CIA is still at the table. Uh, but in other aspects, of course, you're reporting through uh, the DNI and uh, had a wonderful relationship, and it worked out very, very well. And I think it's just established it now. I don't think you're going to go back to the kinds of issues uh, that caused friction in the past. Uh, and so I remain very grateful to him uh, for that. And uh, again, I very much share the praise that has been uh, levied uh, here this afternoon. Um, look, Mike, you and Dutch Ruppersberger really did do it right. And again, uh, four wonderful years of bipartisan leadership of that committee, even when you did occasionally disagree on stuff, even when occasionally we saw things slightly differently, there was always a good dialogue as you said, there weren't people rushing for the microphones out of each of those meetings. Uh, and again, my hat's off to you for that, and really for all the years that you were in there, because in earlier lives and earlier assignments, uh, we had a lot of interaction as well. Um, I, I do think, by the way, it, a lot of people ask you, you know, did you like the position of DNI? I mean, it meant you can't be the director of central intelligence. You know, that, that used to be such a wonderful position. I said, no, I love DNI. Uh, the CIA, I can focus on overseeing an agency that is out trying to steal secrets, recruit spies, carry out covert action, and contribute 
in a very substantial way to the development of the presidential daily brief and all the other analytical products that the DNI pulls together. Um, and you don't have to focus on all the other aspects of the community, which is why I think Jim, Jim noted that typically DCIAs and DCIs, when they were dual, had tended to default over time to DCIA because it's a reasonably consuming endeavor. And frankly, it was great to be unencumbered by the duties that the DCI used to have uh, with the DNI overseeing that. Uh, and so for all of the criticism in the early years of that organization, um, I think, again, it has proven itself, and I think it has proven uh, the wisdom of those who created. Undoubtedly, some tweaks that could still be carried out here or there. Um, and I know that, in fact, talked to Senator Coates about that, Director Coates, uh, the other day. Uh, but I think as history looks back, uh, what we will conclude is that it was Director Clapper who really established what the DNI should do, how it should be done, and indeed what the individual qualities of a DNI should be. Uh, and I do think Senator Coates brings that same gravitas that Mike mentioned, uh, the same confidence, a quiet confidence uh, without a big ego uh, that is the key to succeeding in getting all these different agencies and fiefdoms uh, to work together. Thanks. Okay, thank you. That's a very good way to try to provide a little perspective on an extremely complex uh, maze. Michael, what would you say about uh, either this or the topic, uh, what do we know and what do we need to know about Russia? So I am going to join the chorus um, of uh, praise for these two men on the stage here. Um, Jim Clapper was by far the best DNI we ever had. Um, I did not believe, like Mike, I did not believe um, in the DNI function until I saw Jim do the job. And I really hope that, um, that Dan Coates and, uh, and his successors will continue to do the job the way Jim did. I'm a little concerned, I'm a little concerned that it may be, it may be person dependent, it may be personality dependent. Um, I'm, I hope not, and I hope people learn from Jim, but uh, uh, Jim did a remarkable job. And likewise, um, Mike Rogers was an amazing chairman of an intelligence committee, um, both Senate and House, the best I've ever seen. In fact, I never saw oversight work as effectively as it worked um, in, in, in Mike's committee. Um, I will say from my perspective that, that uh, what I just said and what others have said tonight is true because these two men have incredible integrity, and I saw it every day. Um, and, and, and I really, really mean that. I want to ask a question. Thanks. which is um, really for Mike, I think, which is um, the appropriateness of two congressional investigations into the Russia matter at a time when there's an FBI investigation. How do you think about that? Yeah, I, and I, I was very uh, upfront with this in the beginning. I thought the committees should do the investigation into Russian, um, Russian activities, not necessarily related to the campaign. You know, what did they do? What did the intelligence community know? How long have we seen this activity? What tools did they use? What capabilities do they have? I thought if they could do that and have both a classified and unclassified document that could be released at the end of that investigation, they would provide a public service. Here's, you know, listen, the Russian, we need to watch out for this. We're gonna have to figure out what we do about Russian uh, active measures as they would call it by terminology. And so I thought that that would be a good function for the committees. It would, it would, they could participate in a way that would be very beneficial to the public good. Uh, get, trying to get into you know, who you can call as a witness on a, on a criminal matter, I think is candidly, I, 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 just, I disagree with the way they're doing it. I wouldn't do it this way. Let the FBI have first stab at these these uh, witnesses, and candidly, if I were uh, a lawyer for uh, somebody under investigation, and you know the FBI wants to talk to you next week, you sure as heck aren't gonna let them go up to a committee and testify. I don't know what lawyer in their right mind would do that. So you're never gonna quite get all that you need to get anyway to come to a good conclusion at any rate until after the investigation is over. So I argue the criminal piece of this should be done by the FBI, let them do their work, uh, and then the committees get back to what I would consider regular order for the intelligence community to know 
yes, it would be really important to know the certain, this is what I talked about, capabilities, what are they doing, how, is there a way to defeat it, what's the assessment of the intelligence committee, committee, a community, excuse me, in our ability to, to go after this, and how should we go after it, and then again, produce reports, one that we can all read, uh, and one that's geared toward policy movement in the intelligence community. I think that would be a great day for America if we could do that. If I could just add a point here, because uh, it allows me to emphasize the point about the, uh, the ICA, the intelligence community assessment, and, and something it did not do, was it did not render any judgment whatsoever on whether the Russian interference had actually had any impact on the election, something that some folks deliberately misquoted or, or distorted, but I need, so that allows me to make that point publicly again. All we said in the uh, intelligence community assessment was there was no evidence of, vote, of messing with voter tallies in any of the 50 states. But we never, we have neither the authority, the expertise, or the resources to assess what effect did it actually have on the election. I don't know whether the Congress is the appropriate body to do that, but uh, I think we'll always wonder, in the absence of some uh, competent look at that, did it actually have uh, impact on the election? And that, for us, at least, we didn't, we didn't do that. Mike, do you want to say anything about impact on the election as you try to assess it? Well, I mean, again, it's real. Th try to find a metric where you could say that misinformation led to a, someone changing their vote for who they were. I mean, I think a lot of the vote was baked in before all of this, candidly. If you look back at the timelines, I think a lot of people's opinion of either candidate was already kind of cooked into where they were going. That margin was getting smaller and smaller. By the time the Russians came in, did it impact the election? I, I'm not, I don't know. Uh, and I, I don't think the intelligence community is capable of telling us that either, candidly. Prob neither is the FBI. Right? We know, here's the activities we know that they participated in. Do, would they have loved to influence the fact that we should hate each other when this is all over? Absolutely, the Russians love that, right? So I, that punch I know, that much the intelligence community can tell us. They can also tell us, hey, you know, I think, the, I think one of the statements Director Clapper made was, it was ordered by Putin. I think that's really significant, uh, that you had the head of state of Russia using its military and intelligence services to try to create chaos in the United States elections. That's huge in my mind. I mean, that's, I don't know how much, does it get much bigger than that? Uh, and so I think those are the kinds of things we can know. I think none of us are gonna probably agree, did it influence the election at the end of the day or not? And I don't know if we should have a body charged with trying to figure that out, because there's, uh, some of these would, would have to walk me through the metric you'd use to do that. And I just don't know if it'd be accurate enough. We're just gonna to have to understand what their intentions were, what activities they did, and maybe how we're gonna deal with it. It'd probably be a much better use of our time, I imagine. Okay. This lady, please, and introduce yourself in a short question. Thank you. Thank you, um, I'm Rachel Brown. I'm with the LaRouche Pack. And uh, I have a few details to bring up that I think were, were sort of left out of the discussion. There's been ongoing uh, material around, around the question of the, so, alleged collusion, which you, Clapper, admitted there actually is no collusion between Trump and Russia. Um, <clears throat> you also have a certain track record uh, around honesty, which I think might, might be brought into the, the question uh, today. But uh, we have things like the Christopher Steele document, which, who is an, an MI6 agent who wrote a, a alleged proof of... No, no, no. Short? Question. Yes, okay. Please. Uh, alleged proof of Trump going to Russia and colluding with them, he's an MI6 agent. Uh, the only crime that we have found uh, has not been by the Trump administration, but was the unmasking of the name of General Flynn, uh, which could only have done by, been done by a foreign intelligence service. Uh, it's been widely reported that this was the GCHQ in relation with NSA and FBI. The FBI hired Christopher Steele, or this is under investigation tomorrow, uh, in, Gen in Senator Grassley's committee. Uh, whether or not the, uh, how, how the FBI uh, felt about hiring a foreign agent to investigate the current uh, president, incoming president. This seems to me actually a matter of, of, of treason. Uh, I would look at why okay, there's so, an... Sorry, just okay, just the This is the question part. Uh, it appears as though there is an attack on Trump, uh, President Trump, and this is, I would say, against the American interest. Uh, that we should work with China, we should work with Russia. This okay, is what's under got, attack. We got the question. Good, thank so my, you. My question is, is 
why are you covering for the British intelligence who are acting against our presidency to ensure that we don't have world peace? Okay. Thank, mm. I, I Thank you. I well, couldn't hear the question. Uh, well, so, I'm, let me just say this. Obviously, you're pretty passionate about your information. This is why we need to keep it out of the political side of the conversation. The FBI will do an investigation. And at the end of that conclusion of that investigation, and you may not have You're confidence it's not in political? well, if you don't have confidence in that investigation, I assure you the committees can then come in and do an investigation on their own. The whole purpose of this was to say, right now the emotions run so hot on this. Uh, and again, as a, I can tell you, as a former FBI agent, you spend a lot of time tracing leads. Uh, that don't necessarily Many go crimes anywhere. Crimes have been done by the. Uh, okay, but I'm just telling you, I, and I, I'm not saying I disagree with you. I think that there was some activities of the administration that are questionable that I do believe are currently under the investigation by the FBI. Let's let them make that conclusion on both sides of that equation, and then if that doesn't, uh, you know, satisfy the, the uh, both political parties, uh, trust me, the committees can then engage because then the, then the, the uh, subpoenas are a little harder to get around if there's no criminal action toward that particular. The lady in the lobby, please introduce yourself. Yes. You. Hi, it's my name close is. Close to the microphone. Yep. Uh, my name is Katie Rose. I'm a second year master in public policy student here. Um, my question has to deal with the trade-offs of revealing the information um, that you uncovered in your investigations, um, specifically that um, acknowledging the Russian interference and its success in some ways uh, confirms the objectives of the Russian hack um, and moreover maybe even advances them as they shift towards the European elections. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the impact of um, kind of confirming and advancing those objectives when you're deciding both what kind of information and how much you choose to release to the American people, um, especially since, you know, with this question, I do believe it's important that the American people know this as it impacts uh, their democracy. Thank you. Well, that's a, that, that is a very relevant question, uh, and it was one that was uh, debated. We spent a lot of time discussing, uh, you know, when and, to, and how much we should uh, put out to the public. Uh, the issue here, which uh, you know, President Obama was concerned about, was uh, amplifying or, or dignifying what the Russians were doing, and then and thereby emphasizing its, its import and its impact, and the appearance, if not the reality, of putting his hand on the scale in favor of one candidate and in disfavor uh, of another. And that was a, a major topic of discussion. Uh, the statement that Jay Johnson and I issued on the 7th of October, uh, we had a lot of debate about that, a lot of discussion about whether or not we should do that. Uh, because that in itself could have some impact on, on the election. Jay and I were pretty uh, adamant, uh, assertive about the notion that knowing what we knew, and we didn't say anything about it, and then the, the election happened and it went bad, went south for whatever reason, and then afterwards the public, the Congress, everybody else learns that we had this information and we sat on it without saying something to the electorate. Ergo, the statement on the 7th of October, you can argue that, well, it, wasn't, it was too late or it wasn't fulsome enough, but that's what we did, but that's a, that's a very, uh, I think, key point. As well, by the way, uh, how much and when do we share with uh, foreign governments, who obviously have great interest in particularly European governments, who are seeing you know, the same kinds of things going on there. So we had to reckon with all these uh, sort of countervailing uh, um, concerns and considerations. And, you know, I, I'm sure we'll, we'll write a history about that someday. And I, I'll yeah. just say two things. I, I, I was a little concerned and a little troubled by some of the statements after the election of why information was shared throughout the government. I think that's a dangerous thing. I do think that that's part of an of FBI, FBI investigation. So let them get to the bottom of that. I, and again, I, I was 
troubled to say the least, because that, the way it was disseminated caused, raised some concerns for me. Uh, but again, I think the FBI needs to get to the bottom of that. that if you try to put that into a polit political arena, it'll, you'll, you'll never know what you think by the time you're done. Secondly, I think this is really important to have a public dialogue. We don't have a lot of options on how to get at this. And this is that one interesting time where the Russian, wasn't, you know, the Russian intelligence officer was not trying to recruit Jim Clapper to, to, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, commit an act of treason against his own country in the back third world of you know, fill in the blank. This was a very public display about trying to influence average Americans going about their day in a way that we really hadn't seen before at this level and magnitude. So my argument was at some point we better have a conclusion or at least a, a, a public discussion so that if I'm reading this material, and by the way, we, you know, these elections now are more about affirmation politics, right? If I agree with this position and I read this article, then that article is right. And if I read this article and I disagree with it, then they're just wrong. We should at least start getting people to understand that someone is trying to say uh, and they're tar very targeted. They started going into certain demographics and people's beliefs and understanding what kind of material they were reading. This was really deep and very detailed intelligence analysis on a large scale. I think it, we all should understand that people are gonna try to do that to you the next time you walk into the voting booth. You ought to understand that someone out there, today it's the Russians, who knows, is trying to make some kind of an influence statement on this. And this is where I worried about it from a public official. Uh, that used to run for election uh, and you know get the snot kicked out of you. And that was fun when we didn't have this problem. Think of that. So I come out very strongly and say, I'm in favor of tougher Russian sanctions. And an article comes out in some magazine next week and says, Mike Rogers was you know, naked running with goats in, uh, you know, and here's a picture, a grainy one, you can hard to tell, but that, isn't that him, right? And that thing goes viral. Why? Because they don't like my position on sanctions. The influence of that can be catastrophic. And in the court of public opinion, that member of office, he's, he or she is cooked, right? Because the people who don't like them already believe it. The people who aren't sure think, really, that happened? Right? <laughs> and the people who you know, love that person are gonna love them no matter what. They're like, I run naked with goats. That happens all the time. No, we who should was, be concerned? We thought it was cows. So, yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen but, here. Hi, uh, my name is Shri Kulkarni. I'm a mid-career student here. My question is about the standards of evidence for collusion. Uh, at this point in 1973, we had a Senate Select Committee, a special prosecutor, and the deputy director of the FBI leaking to the Washington Post. And still, a year and a half later, it was only when we kn knew that there were tapes in the White House that we actually had enough evidence to connect the president to this burglary. Now we have a much bigger crime, uh, but in the absence of any wiretapping, is it possible to establish that evidence of collusion uh, with this administration? And if, if that evidence is established, what is the crime? Is it treason? Well, Go ahead. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lot of fun. <laughs> he did this in committee, I'm too, I want you to know. Oversight. Yeah. Yeah. Former um, FBI police sir. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A, it's, I'd have to, it would be interesting to determine what crime they're investigating. I don't think it would be collusion. I think they're probably looking at financial interest, this, and I don't know, probably even shouldn't say that. I, I think they're looking at other elements of a crime going into this investigation, would be my guess. It, collusion would be pretty hard to filter down a, as a criminal activity, other than some would argue the legal notion of, of using a foreign government to influence a U.S. election. You know, they could charge with that, not really collusion, it's something different. I, I do think that the FBI will, will pursue this till its ultimate conclusion. And if, if, in fact, it gets to that ultimate conclusion and it doesn't pass the smell test, I think you'll get uh, these investigations in Congress. I just think we have to let the FBI do it. It's a different day than it was uh, in Watergate. You know, the FBI is a very different organization today than it was back then. Uh, and boy, they're a dog with a bone. They will continue this investigation until they have just wrung out every lead that they can find. I passionately believe that. Uh, again, and then there's alternatives afterward. All of the fuss on the front end is just designed to try to, uh, you know, affirm your political belief of what you think happened. 
And I think that's a dangerous thing in the court of public opinion. I do think that let them have this investigation. You don't even have to like Trump or not like Trump or love Trump or hate Trump. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter. When you have the federal government investigating the possibility of taking away someone's freedom, there's protections for that for a reason. And we ought to let that thing happen before we get engaged in, again, as I said, the court of public opinion. Because the court of public opinion, candidly, has very low standards. Uh, our legal system has pretty high standards, and we ought to try to keep it that way, be my argument. Okay, please. Uh, I'm just a little bit worried about the goats. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, it was one time. Inter we were running in, in the woods. Fair enough. In introduce yourself and quickly your question. Uh, Bruce Schneier, uh, Belfer Center. I want to ask about a kind of obscure area of this, and that's the shadow brokers leaking NSA secrets, which really seems like another very public display of capability. Uh, we don't know it's the Russians. We believe it is. Uh, Director Clapper, you might know and can't tell us. But what does that say about the intelligence community around the world that leaking these powerful tools are now more important than keeping them secret and using them. That really feels very different to me. Yeah. I'm not sure I understood the question. So, to say it very briefly. The question's about the shadow brokers and the NSA secrets that are being the leaked. Shadow the brokers, shadow brokers. Yes. Which is the group that's leaking. That's, that's the leaking the NSA. Not the CIA secrets, that's someone who gave them to WikiLeaks. But my question is, what does it say about the world of intelligence that the public opinion benefit of leaking these outweighs the classified benefit of using them. Who, who says that the public yeah, I'm benefit outweighs? I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming the person who leaked them decided that leaking them is more important than keeping them secret. Right? And Someone I, made that decision. Yeah, and I know you do have some strong feelings on this, but I will tell you that's why we have rules about classified information. One person does not get to make that decision. No, 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 but, the somebody did. Somebody said, leaked that information. Not in the U.S. Someone in, if it's Russia or China or another country, well, someone the, there did yeah. it. I think there's probably some, uh, I, I, well, I think the Russians ended up getting the material. How they got it is in question. And it may, by, may, be, an in, may be by an individual that they either co-opted or voluntarily they gave it, which is why I think you saw the CIA director uh, a couple of weeks ago come out very strongly and say that WikiLeaks is an agent of the Russian government, meaning, you can just extrapolate that, that, that whatever material they're getting their hands on, they're purposely trying to uh, have, have an outlet to publicly, uh, I think, uh, you know, embarrass, if you will, or cause us real harm. And by the way, it causes us real harm, and they've also exposed tools that now fall into the hands of what would normally be less capable hackers. Now they have pretty good material to come at uh, everybody, all of us, and I, so there's a whole host of problems with that. Um, I, you know, and I, I passionately believe you can't allow one person to decide what they think, because by the way, when you're at that level in these intelligence agencies, you don't get to see the whole picture. You get to see a little piece of the picture, so you can't make the decision based on what you see that you think something awful and, and terrible and corrupt is happening, because you have no understanding of all the things happening around it and all the oversight that's happened, all the conclusion about what, why that uh, information is classified. And I'm very worried that we've gotten this culture now that if I just decide I don't like it, I'm going to walk out and give it to the Russians. Why not? Well, you know, my argument is that's is about as close to treasonous as you get. And we could go through a whole list of problems that actually happened overseas by the, these uh, unauthorized disclosures that caused real harm to our national security and jeopardized the lives of our soldiers in the long run. And we, you know, there's, there's pretty clear evidence of that. That, to me, we've got to get, get right in our heads here as we move forward, because this is only going to get harder. Uh, and the Russians have, have you know, cracked a weakness here that they're going to try to take advantage of over and over and over again. Thank you very much yeah. for your good. Thank I'm you for. Sure excuse me. You had a chance to. Excuse me. There, there are plenty of. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So let me say, tonight we've come to the witching hour. It's not 7:14. You can give your speech after we leave. I apologize for the people that have, have questions. Let me say thank you very much for these two gentlemen. <laughs> the Larus people seem to come to your attention. We, we, believe, we, believe, uh, we believe strongly in free speech here, but only one speech that in an evening, or two when we have two guests. So thank you. You're welcome to talk after we leave. Yep. <laughs>